Welcome back, I'm that Chemist, and today we have a story where somebody's doer of liquid nitrogen overpressurized and exploded. I witnessed some idiot using an old halon extinguisher, wherever that fossil came from is unknown, on burning magnesium. It was bad. Enormous brown clouds covering the whole site and everybody running for their life. Luckily, nobody was permanently injured. The long-term outcome might be a different thing, though. The fire that they put out was small, and it could have just burned out on its own with minimal damage, or it could have been covered with sand that was kept close for that exact purpose. So the issue here is the halogenated fire extinguishers would just keep reacting with the magnesium. Whereas the type of fire extinguisher used for pyrophoric metals usually would just suffocate the fire. So it's fortunate that for the most part we don't use those halon fire extinguishers anymore because that is crazy. Small molten metal story. My dad, because we were very poor growing up in the 90s, rebuilt the engines and other parts of the family van when they broke. One day he was working underneath the van on the starter. He had disconnected the battery and was removing whatever was holding the assembly in place. Somehow, the battery cables wiggled their way back to the battery terminals. So at some point, my dad's gold wedding ring shorted the two electrical connections straight from the battery. Oh no! The arc managed to melt a chunk of the ring and violently splatter gold all over my dad's face, mostly his upper lip, because of the grimace he was making trying to get the starter to come out. It hurt pretty bad and he couldn't shave for months, but he avoided any serious injury luckily. And not being a stupid person, he never did work on a car without double checking the safety of what he was doing first, like removing batteries, wearing gloves, etc. And that is the story of how my dad unwillingly grew a mustache for a year. That's so awful, I can't believe that happened. It's crazy that the wedding ring was able to short it for long enough that the gold was actually able to melt and spray everywhere. I've heard that gold is a relatively dangerous metal to melt because it has a tendency to splatter, so that is quite terrifying. I just realized I have a story. When I was about four, I grabbed the oven cleaner just before my mom was going to use it. I wanted to help by spraying down the oven, but it had a spray paint style nozzle and I blasted myself in both eyes. My mother waterboarded me under the bathtub faucet for 15 minutes before taking me to the ER. Oh, that's awful. You're lucky that you didn't lose eyesight as a result of that. That's, uh, that's a really crazy story. A similar story to the potassium pants predicament. In my first high school chemistry class, we were told the story of a former student who had taken a liking to a similar reaction of sodium and water. This student snuck into the chemical storage room and decided to steal a golf ball sized piece of sodium, which he put in his pants pocket. Over the next hour, the moisture from his leg caused the sodium to heat up in his pocket, so the student decided he had to get rid of it. To get rid of the warm lump of sodium, the student had the genius idea of flushing the lump down the toilet. My teacher said that the entire school shook from the explosion, and the student was found in the newly flooded bathroom with a broken leg from the piece of toilet that struck him in the leg. Oh my gosh, that's awful. I've always wanted to see this reaction firsthand, but the school wisely banned the continued use of sodium around a bunch of high schoolers. This is crazy. This is kind of like another story that we had recently where somebody had flushed sodium down the drain and that ended up causing a detonation that was felt for some distance as well. It still surprises me that this can actually happen, but I'm not about to like test this and detonate it in my city's sewer system because that is an experiment that is not worth testing. Not a chemistry setting at all, but I have a friend who works in a shop. One of the things their work involves is welding. They had just prepared a part for welding using brake clean and forgot to wipe off the surface before preheating that part of the weld. He ended up hitting the part with a blowtorch and immediately filled the entire shop with phosgene gas having to evacuate. So the crazy thing about tetrachloroethylene, which is the solvent that was used here, is that when it's heated with a flame in the presence of oxygen, it can cleave that carbon-carbon double bond into phosgene. And phosgene is extremely toxic and dangerous. It still surprises me that it's used as a solvent despite the likelihood that this can occur. But if they were to stop using tetrachloroethylene, I guess they would just have to use another solvent anyway. Hearing these stories, I'm glad that the biggest accident I ever had was spilling about half a liter of dichloromethane on my crotch while doing my masters. I must have made a small crack in the glass when putting the full 3 liter glass Winchester in my fume hood, and didn't realize that it was leaking. When I wanted to put it back in the solvent cupboard, I noticed that some liquid had spilled into my fume hood as I was holding the big bottle against my body. After a good 10 seconds of trying to figure out what was going on, I felt something cold on my lap and realized the situation. I calmly put down the bottle on the bench and asked for help, and one of the PhD students put the bottle in the fume hood, where the bottle cracked clean open and spilled the remaining 2 liters of DCM through the fume hood opening onto the floor. Oh my gosh. Needless to say, we evacuated the bay for 10 minutes and I went to the bathroom to clean up. I now realize I should have just stripped there and then, but luckily the slight burning sensation was gone in a minute, and the thing to remind me is some dye from my belt dissolving and drying up onto my pants. Yeah, you got really lucky. It would have been really unfortunate if you had to test the solubility of a sparrow's nest in dichloromethane. So my university lab is near a dye factory. Actually, it may have been a pigment factory. The place is now closed and is being demolished. 
The blue dye slash pigment was apparently non-toxic. In fact, it was so safe that one of the workers would eat some to prove how safe it was. Edit. I think like a big handful, if I remember the story correctly. I heard he would defecate blue for days after this. I did not witness this. This has been told to me by a staff member who has worked at the factory when it was still open approximately 30 years ago. Yes, I know there's a difference between dyes and pigments. I just could not remember which one it was. So a lot of the things that are safe to eat are safe to eat in the amounts that we normally would have them in products. So if you have some food coloring in a food, the amount that you have in a given dish might be an acceptable safe amount to eat. But just because it's safe to eat in a small scale doesn't mean if you eat like a thousand times as much of it, you're not going to have issues. This also applies to medication, right? It might be fine for you to have one Advil, but if you have a thousand Advils, you're going to start having issues. Just because there isn't much activity of a molecule at the level you normally consume it in doesn't mean that at some higher dose it's safe to eat. In this case, I hope that this guy was safe because that still sounds like a really dumb thing to do, especially after hearing about the blue dye in the last episode. My neighbor, as a kid, this would have been in 1995 or 1996, had gotten an old free toilet to replace his completely shattered one. The only problem was that the free one was very stained. He hooked up the toilet and figured that he'd just remove the stains with some bleach. So he left for work that day, and his wife, who worked from home doing clerical stuff, decided she would do something about the stains. So she took some 9% hydrogen peroxide hair bleach that she had left over from when she had just bleached her niece's hair and just threw it in the toilet. It must not have been doing much because when her husband got home, he took some standard laundry bleach, sodium hypochlorite type, not sodium percarbonate type, and threw it into the toilet. Apparently about an hour later, they heard the characteristic sound of shattering porcelain, and the new old toilet had broken near the drain hole. That was when I learned that mixing hydrogen peroxide with chlorine bleach could produce explosions. It wasn't until later that I learned the reason was a truly massive yield of pure oxygen gas that probably expanded things so much that they shattered. The only thing I have to add here is that not only does this reaction produce oxygen, but it produces singlet oxygen, which is a really powerful oxidizer, and even though it has a really short half-life, if you breathe any of it in, it could just wreck your lungs. Singlet oxygen is extremely reactive. It's oxygen in its excited state. One thing that happened at her place many years ago, before I was there, so this is secondhand info, is that a cleaner had cleaned the floor in the Ethidium bromide room, and then cleaned the rest of the floors. Because the floor in the Ethidium bromide room is considered contaminated, all the other floors had to be cleaned by a special decontamination cleaning crew, and all of the water and wipes had to be disposed of as hazardous waste. That's crazy. That sounds like a really expensive thing to do. Ethidium bromide is considered to be a carcinogen because it can intercalate the DNA, although compared to some other carcinogens, it's a relatively minor one. That being said, spreading it like butter over an entire loaf of bread? Probably not great. The story with the melting bra reminded me of the girl from my high school. This story isn't chemistry, but also about modesty over protection. We were in biology class, looking at assorted plant cell samples under microscopes, and preparing our own slides with slivers of white onion, which we were to get razor thin and dye so that they could be visualized on slides. The first thing we had to do is wash the onion slices to get rid of any debris that might interfere with the slides later. People were spilling water on the floor while crowding around to wash the onion slices. There was one large basin sink in the room. The floor was standard public building linoleum type stuff over concrete and was pretty slick already. So she walks by and slips pretty catastrophically and while she was falling, rather than trying to catch her balance or something, she held her skirt down with both hands and hit the hard floor head first. I was on the other side of the room at this point, looking on in confusion wondering why one, no one tried to catch her, and two, she didn't try to catch herself. She ended up with a concussion and had to miss her volleyball. The semifinals, they were eliminated, as well as several days of school. This particular image of someone trying to preserve modesty over life has always struck with me and always will. I'd like to think that she'd learned her lesson from that, but I haven't even seen her since 2005. This is another story which really highlights the importance of taking care of your safety first. You should always prioritize your safety first and modesty second. I've seen a few cases where a screw-up could easily cost a significant fraction of, or more than, someone's annual salary. In 1985, I interviewed with Texas Alkyls, a producer of aluminum alkyls for the Gulf Coast petrochemicals industry, and was shown an interesting glove box setup where they were using an all-glass spinning band distillation system to produce a kilo of electronics-grade trimethyl gallium, which then sold for $1,000 a gram. Yikes. I doubt any of the operators were making a million per year. The closest I came was using $38,000 worth of carbon-13 labeled ethylene, approximately 100 grams, I think, for a polymerization run. I think I was making about $60,000 per year at the time. The run went to plan. I'm glad to hear that that expensive reaction went as planned. That is a very stressful situation. This is something that undergrad researchers quite often encounter because they might be doing a reaction that costs $500 worth of reagents, and that makes them extra cautious. But as you can see, there's examples in industry where you might be working on a much larger scale, and so the stakes are a lot higher. 
Now that being said, if you're doing chemistry with isotopes, the nice thing is you can always practice the chemistry on the less expensive carbon-12 analog or hydrogen-1 analog. And so it's good to just do that, get comfortable with the procedure, then switch out the radio-labeled analog. The city of Warsaw, where I live, uses clams as a method for detecting impurities in the water supply. The clams are connected to sensors using springs and are constantly monitored by computers. This is of course just one of the many methods used in water treatment, but the overall quality of the water is one of the best in the region. This sounds really cool, and I'd love to see this in person someday. It was my first day at university. I just started in my chemistry bachelor's. In our inorganic chemistry course, we had one of my professor's earlier students show us some experiments mid-lecture. On that day, we were going through the alkali metals. So he started off by showing us the different alkali metal reactions with water. After that, he was like, well, I know you want to see it on a bigger scale. So he took a big beaker and put it in the fume hood that we had in the auditorium. He then took quite a big piece of sodium metal and put it in the water. Right before, he said, it might be a bit too big, but let's just go for it. Well, the sodium started reacting with water, and suddenly the hydrogen that it produced lit on fire, and after a few seconds, the beaker exploded, with the beaker exploding out the sash of the fume hood as well. The most ironic thing about it was that the day after that, we had the lab safety introduction course with him. He had to edit his PowerPoint slide with accidents that happened in the last five years. So I'm sure right now you're thinking, I would love to see that reaction. Guess what? We have this reaction on video from two different perspectives. Here's the first. So you can see he's putting the big chunk of sodium in, and he's leaving it. And it just completely gets wrecked. And as you can see, there's a little iPhone on a tripod there videoing this. Guess what? We have that footage as well. So this one's a little bit longer. This one's a lot nicer in my opinion because you get to see the close-up shot right there. And the students are very amused by this. As I'm sure you would be as well. Quite an entertaining reaction to be sure. Today's Yikes Wardy is Christina T. My high school chemistry teacher was about to retire, so he had a stockroom full of old chemicals that he needed to use up and zero hex left to give. He did a lot of explosive demos at the beginning of class. I was assigned a seat in the front row, so I frequently shielded myself with my binder. Yeah, that's pretty scary. I would have asked to be switched to a different row, and if anybody asked why, you could just say that the teacher's doing stuff that's not very safe, and maybe you'll get to move seats. Maybe you won't even have to worry about moving seats, because maybe they won't do dangerous demos anymore. That's pretty sketchy. This is today's big story. So here's a fun story from my grad school days. Normally, liquid nitrogen tanks, which are called doers, are fitted with pressure relief fittings, but this tank, which the lab had had since 1980, had both fittings fail at some point in the past. Instead of getting a new tank, the holes were fitted with metal plugs and welded off. This is less of an issue in my experience because the distributors for liquid nitrogen, such as Praxair, usually just own the tanks and you're just renting the tank while they give you the tank with liquid nitrogen. I guess if this was a larger scale doer, like a permanent doer built on site, then that would make more sense. But in my mind, the like 100 liter doers are usually just delivered and they're rotating all the time. So I'll just quickly explain how a doer works. So basically, a doer is just a container like this. In the top of it, you'll have a couple outlets, one for the gas to come out of, and this will have like a vacuum around it. Now, you'll also have another valve that goes all the way into the liquid. And so this is how you pull out the liquid nitrogen, just like this. Additionally, you'll have a pressure relief valve. And so here we'll just see PV for pressure relief. Now you have your liquid nitrogen in here, and if you need to draw out liquid nitrogen, because there's pressure in the headspace, the pressure will just push it out the tube if you open up the liquid nitrogen fill port. Now if you need to get nitrogen gas from this, you can just use the gas adapter. And if this builds up too much pressure, let's say above 300 PSI, if you have a 300 PSI tank, it will just release the pressure until the internal pressure gets below that threshold. It'll just occasionally vent. Maybe this is once an hour, maybe this is a few times an hour, it just kind of depends on how old it is and how good all the mechanisms work. The issue in this story is that that pressure valve wasn't working. And because that pressure valve wasn't working, the doer eventually just built more and more pressure. So much pressure that the doer couldn't handle it anymore. Why it didn't blow before this was a real stumper, but presumably people were taking liquid nitrogen out of it quickly enough to keep it together. Around 3am, when no one was in the lab, the internal tank expanded to press against the external tank, so the only place for further expansion was the ends. Well, the bottom of the tank ruptured around a 1200 PSI load. 
I saved a copy of the report from the engineer and have it attached here. This is where things get scary. The cylinder had been standing on the end of a 20 foot by 40 foot laboratory on the second floor of the chemistry building. It was on a tile covered four to six inch concrete floor directly over a reinforced concrete beam. The explosion blew all the tile off the floor in a five foot radius of the tank, turning the tile into quarter sized bits of shrapnel that embedded into the walls of the lab. The blast cracked the floor, but due to the presence of the supporting beam, which shattered, the floor held. Since the floor held, the force of the explosion was directed upwards and propelled the cylinder, without the bottom, through the concrete ceiling of the lab and into the maintenance room above. It struck two three-foot water mains and drove them into the electrical wiring above the roof of the building, cracking it. The cylinder came to rest on the third floor of the building, leaving a 20-inch diameter hole in its wake. The entrance door and wall of the lab were blown out in the hallway, and the remaining walls were four to eight inches off of their foundations. All of the windows, except for one that had been left open, were blown out into the courtyard. That is absolutely insane, and it really highlights that a high-pressure system is literally a bomb, and it can be extremely dangerous. This is also an example of heating a closed system. Acetylene is horrible. We had an entire day's worth of training on it back when I was in the Rescue Specialist Force during conscription. It's the number one cause of firefighter deaths worldwide, up there with backdrafts. That's really scary to hear, and it's surprising to hear that it's that high. So this accident happened at my school one or two years ago. That morning, I came to school and the whole schoolyard was full of fire trucks. When I got to the place that my class usually meets up at, I saw my teacher explaining to the rest of the class that some poison gas was detected in our school, and that the whole school had to evacuate the gymnasium immediately. In the gymnasium, our principal explained that we could phone our parents to pick us up, and we had the next day off. She didn't say a word about what was actually causing the emergency. At the beginning of this year, I found out what was actually going on. Some context. Our school has three buildings all connected through hallways. It turns out that our janitor was cleaning the toilets in one of the buildings and mixed multiple cleaners together. I don't know how much of the cleaning mix he actually used, but it was enough to fill the entire building with hydrogen sulfide gas. Fortunately, no one was injured, but the janitor was fired very soon after the incident. I'm not sure how you would be generating hydrogen sulfide gas with cleaning agents, but that's a really scary thing to hear. If you have any ideas about what chemicals the janitor might have had as cleaners that, when mixed, would have produced hydrogen sulfide, I'd be interested to hear them in the comments. That reminds me of when my PhD advisor set up a base bath and left a brush in there. I don't remember what the brush was made of, but one day, he went to pull the brush out and all he pulled out was the handle. The rest of the brush had completely disintegrated. The only things that should be going in a base bath are usually glassware. You can try putting plastic and other stuff in there, but if you put in the wrong type of plastic, let me tell you, that whole thing is going to be gone the next time you try and remove it. These sound effects simply elevate the video. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day.